mysterious crash in New Mexico. Flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Today, the U.S. government says there were no flying discs outside Roswell in 1947 and has closed the case on the entire incident. But some Americans think the government isn't telling all it knows about UFOs. Dozens of eyewitness accounts. This is something that did not come from Earth. Hundreds of top secret documents. On several of the pages, you can read eight words. The rest is blacked out. The potentially damning evidence, not just of an alien crash, but possibly of a six-decade government cover-up. Here it was in black and white, because I remember it almost <laughs> sent chills down my spine. To a small but dedicated group of UFO researchers, this barren ranch land, 75 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico, is sacred territory. It's the place where they believe one or more alien spaceships crashed to Earth sometime in early July, 1947. I think there was probably a mid-air collision that resulted in one going one way and exploding and dumping all the wreckage out in the debris field, the other making it down almost intact. Today, that crash, commonly referred to as the Roswell incident, is the stuff of legend. But we might never have heard of Roswell if not for a former nuclear physicist turned UFO researcher named Stan Friedman. After spending nearly 30 years investigating the incident, hunting down dozens of key witnesses and scores of top secret documents, Friedman is convinced that the US government is covering up a UFO crash. This is his proof. It begins in 1978, when after giving a lecture on UFOs, someone casually asks if he's ever met former military intelligence officer Jesse Marcel. Brilliant investigator that I am, I said, who's he? I never heard of him. Oh, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage in one of those saucers you're interested in. What? Friedman tracks down Marcel in Louisiana, and first hears the fantastic tale about the day Marcel helped recover a real alien spaceship. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, an area about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. So, uh, Jesse tells me a story was in newspapers all around the world, but he doesn't remember the exact date. And he tells me how they took the wreckage to Fort Worth, Texas, and he was told not to say anything Friedman checks with the local Roswell paper, and sure enough, there it is. July 8, 1947, Roswell Army Air Force captures flying saucer. It was a big sensational thing. Front page headlines, not just the Roswell Daily Record, which is kind of a small paper, but in the West Coast papers, Los Angeles Herald Express, huge paper, and so forth. But there's a follow-up story, too. One day later, a report from the U.S. military that the wreckage isn't a crashed UFO after all. It's pieces of a downed weather balloon. But now, 30 years later, here's Marcel telling Friedman the balloon story is false, part of a cover-up by the US government. One thing I was certain of, being familiar with all air activities, that it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. In the weeks leading up to the Roswell incident, the country is gripped by UFO fever after a commercial pilot reports seeing nine strange objects flying over Washington state. He said that they acted like saucers bobbing or skipping across the water. It was from him that the term flying saucer came from. Hundreds of flying saucer sightings pour in, especially in New Mexico, home to top secret test sites for V-2 rockets and atomic and nuclear weapons. The city of Roswell itself is the base of the 509th, the world's only atomic air squadron. Just two years earlier, it had dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If aliens were going to be interested in anything that happened on this planet, boy, they'd make a beeline for New Mexico. As the story goes, on that fateful night in early July 1947, a violent thunderstorm rolls through Roswell. Out in the desert, rancher Mac Brazel sleeps fitfully in his tiny cabin. There had been a big electric storm, and he heard what he thought was an explosion that didn't sound like thunder. 
The next morning, Brazel checks on his animals and notices they won't cross a pasture. He goes for a closer look and stumbles across debris littered over a large field. And he finds this huge amount of stuff, strange material, covering an area hundreds of feet wide by almost three quarters of a mile long. The material is odd, lightweight, but incredibly strong. Brazel carries a few pieces to his neighbor's ranch. Kind of a tan, light brown plastic. Brazel mentions other debris, items covered with strange writing. He said the writing wasn't like Japanese writing, but it was, I imagine, more like hieroglyphics or something like that. The strangest material looks like aluminum foil but with a weird ability to return to its original shape. If you picked it up and folded it, it would unfold. And if you folded it several times, it would still unfold. And you couldn't tear it. Brazel drags some of the debris to a shed. A few days later, he's on the phone with Frank Joyce, a local DJ and radio reporter. He began to talk about things that, that might be out of this world. I thought maybe this is uh, a hoax. During the conversation, Joyce says Brazel mentions finding bodies in the wreckage. And one thing that he mentioned on the phone was the horrible odor that was with these bodies. Thinking Brazel might be insane, Joyce tries to end the call. I advised him to go to the U.S. Army Air Corps because they are flyers and will know what to do about anything that flies. Brazel does call Roswell Army Airfield. Major Jesse Marcel answers the phone. Marcel reports the call to his commanding officer, who orders him and a counterintelligence officer to go investigate. He says, go out with him, because the rancher said there's a whole mess of this stuff out there, and nothing that he brought in was conventional. At the ranch, Marcel is also puzzled by the debris. He gathers it up and heads back to Roswell. He's so excited by the potential discovery, he stops by his home after midnight and wakes his wife and 11-year-old son, Jesse Jr. He said something like, uh, this is parts of what we feel is a flying saucer. Jesse Marcel Jr. is a doctor and colonel in the U.S. Army Reserves. He just got back from Iraq. He's writing a manuscript called Roswell, It Really Happened. Even though it happened many years ago, he still vividly remembers what his father showed him that night. I picked up the material and it was, I noticed it had a very strange quality to it. It was very light. I didn't try to bend it or tear it, uh, but I just kind of looked at it and just kind of wondered what this was. Marcel's father continues on to the base to report his findings to his superiors. The next morning, the base commander orders the public information officer to write a press release about the incident. He gave me exactly what he wanted in the press release, that we had in our possession a flying disc. The story hits the airwaves, creating an instant sensation. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army but almost as quickly begins what appears to be a government cover-up. From the time that story came out, I felt that someone somewhere was trying to stop every last word of this story. of the mysterious crashed disc puts the world's focus on Roswell, New Mexico. This was too good to be true. We couldn't really believe a story like this that, that it really was authentic. But within hours of those first shocking reports comes a flurry of high-level military interest, strange shipments to other air bases, and fear. For people like Major Jesse Marcel, it's the beginning of a conspiracy to cover up what really happened at Roswell. Marcel is ordered to escort the wreckage, first to Fort Worth Army Airfield in Texas, and then on to Wright Airfield in Ohio. Why Wright Field? That's where captured enemy equipment normally went. 
right here development center is there and they take things apart and find out how they're made. In Hangar 84 at Roswell Army Airfield, the wreckage is boxed up and loaded onto a B-29 airplane. Personnel report seeing a procession of people carrying boxes of strange looking debris and something even more ominous, another flight, this one carrying bodies. The bodies were taken to the hospital first. And supposedly then, this is where the C-54 was brought and they loaded up. He flew from here. At about the same time, the local undertaker in Roswell receives a strange call from the base, asking about the availability of child-sized coffins and embalming techniques for bodies left outdoors. Later, he runs into a panicked nurse at the base who tells him she witnessed an alien autopsy. I knew the lady quite well, and she said, look, Glenn, she said, she was screaming, get out of here, get out of here as fast as you can, because you are going to get in a lot of trouble. She describes what she saw in detail. The heads were very large. They were pliable like a newborn baby. The description of the bodies is pretty consistent by anyone who claims that they have seen them. Kind of grayish to grayish green with uh, a large head, large dark uh, black eyes. But it's the wreckage that would soon spark charges of a government cover-up. When Marcel and his strange cargo arrive in Texas, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, head of the 8th Air Force, is waiting to inspect the debris. The general asks Marcel to step into a nearby map room to show where it was found. When they return, the debris is gone, allegedly switched with material from what appears to be a common weather balloon. According to uh, Marcel in his last interview, there were some wrapped packages there. He says they hid the debris from the uh, photographers who came in, but what, what was in the picture was just staged. It was just, you know, it was just the cover story. The press snapped several photos of various officials posing with the debris, including Jesse Marcel. <laughs> he kind of looks kind of sheepish, like, you know, they're okay, guys, I'll hold it up here, but this, you know, this is uh, not what I saw. Years later, Stan Friedman believes he's confirmed the cover story when he gets a signed affidavit from the General's Chief of Staff who says the weather balloon story was to divert the attention of the press. And it comes on direct orders from the Deputy Commander of Strategic Air Command in Washington, D.C. He gave him three orders. I want you to send some of that wreckage here today with one of your Colonel Couriers. I want you to get the press off our backs. I don't care how you do it. And I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even with your buddy, Roger Ramey. The alleged cover story works. Just a day after the fantastic tale broke, the media and the public buy into the new story. People really believed in the military back then. It was right after World War II, and the military had saved us, you know, from fascism. After the photo op, the wreckage is flown to a new unknown destination, while Marcel is ordered to return to Roswell and forget the entire incident. When he came back and he had my mother and I kind of together, he said, you know, guys, we're not to talk about this anymore. Treat it like a non-event, didn't happen. So may not forget about it, but don't talk about it, not even with your friends. And we didn't. Others are also allegedly pressured to keep silent or change their stories. A few days after the photo op, rancher Mac Brazel pays a visit to Frank Joyce at the radio station. He said, I found out after I left here that that what I told you out on the ranch was not accurate. What the crash was, was a weather balloon. But Joyce says he uncovers Brazel's fib when he asks what happened to the alien bodies. And I said, you know, it brings up what people are talking about recently, the stories you hear about little green men. And in a quiet voice, he said, they weren't green. I think Brazel may very well have seen the bodies, but again, that would be another reason for putting a thumb down on it. While Roswell investigators are able to confirm the balloon cover story, getting what they believe is confirmation of the alien bodies would take much longer. My reaction, as I remember, as I said, here it was in black and white talking about bodies and a disc. When they do find it, 
The smoking gun is in, of all places, the very hand of the man at the center of the alleged Roswell cover-up. After the debris from a crashed UFO is identified as a simple weather balloon, interest in the Roswell incident dies down and is soon forgotten altogether. But the principals in this drama, like Major Jesse Marcel, never forget. It was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else of which we didn't know what it was. Marcel's son remembers his father as adamant the truth was being hidden. I remember him saying later that uh, he was part of the cover-up because he went along with the story publicly, but privately, he didn't. According to researcher Stan Friedman, the U.S. military doesn't forget the incident either. Instead, Roswell becomes the launch pad for what he calls a cosmic water gate, an ongoing government conspiracy to hide the truth about extraterrestrial UFOs. It's clear that there were people in the government taking this seriously. It was also clear that they made a conscious attempt to cover things up. Just a few weeks after the Roswell incident, the National Security Council is created, the president's highest level and most secret advisory group. Obviously, UFOs would come under the aegis of the National Security Council. This is what bypassed the Constitution, the Congress, the news media, and the public. This is where the subject of UFOs went deep and dark. I'm here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. Also in 1947, the Air Force establishes what would be called Project Blue Book, a program to track all UFO sightings across the nation. The Air Force interest in this problem is to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. So many sightings are reported. Friedman claims the military issues special orders in response. Air Force pilots were being ordered in 1952, summer, to shoot down UFOs if they didn't land when instructed to do so. And we have General Roger Ramey, by this time a major general and a primary actor in the Roswell story, saying we scrambled jets hundreds of times after saucers. The Air Force investigates more than 12,000 sightings over 22 years. To this day, 700 remain unexplained. But to Roswell's true believers, the real purpose of Project Blue Book isn't to find UFOs. It's to debunk the very notion of them. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, erroneously identified friendly aircraft, meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. Everything that was reported could somehow be explained as the planet Venus, unidentified aircraft, satellites, or swamp gas, anything they could come up with. Project Blue Book is shelved in 1969, after the Air Force decides UFOs pose no threat to national security. But according to Jim Mars, the government didn't stop researching them. There have been literally dozens of uh, documents pried out of the CIA, out of the military, and, and, and others that show that behind the scenes there is an intense interest in what these things are, where they come from, and what they're up to. Over the years, Roswell researchers say they've petitioned the government to release whatever information it has, with little success. We went after the CIA. We want all your UFO stuff. We don't have any UFO stuff. You do too. You do not. We argue. We go to court. The judge says do a search. They come back. Oh, gee, we found 900 pages of UFO materials. They said they had none. Even when documents are released, such as this affidavit from the National Security Agency, they're often highly censored. 
eventually we got it. The only trouble is it's about 80% blacked out. But why would the government hide what it knows about UFOs, and especially the Roswell incident? Friedman believes it's because the alien bodies are hidden away in secret government laboratories and the wreckage is being studied for scientific advancements. For proof, he points to the revolutionary aircraft developed in the past six decades. Here's our fastest manned craft, the Apollo Command Module, and it looks like a flying saucer. Secret laboratories, engineering wonders. It seems unbelievable, unless you believe there really was an alien crash landing in Roswell. David Rudiak says he has proof of that. It's this 1947 photograph. This is one of seven photos known to have been taken in the office of General Roger Ramey. The photograph is from the day the U.S. military identified the Roswell debris as nothing more than a weather balloon. In it, Ramey is kneeling beside the debris, clutching a piece of paper. Seems pretty unremarkable, until you look closer. The real prize is what Ramey is holding in his hand right here. And you can see as you zoom in that there's writing on this paper. Using a digital photo scanner to enlarge and enhance the document, Rudiak says he can make out the words that prove there was an alien spacecraft. This was a brand new use of the word disc, the uh, flying saucers or flying discs, and uh, the terminology had been around for less than two weeks, and so the newspapers, for example, often enclosed the word disc in quotes. Then, in the same paragraph, a shocker. The real key to this message is this word right here, which uh, the initial group identified as being the word victims. Rudiak deciphers more of the paragraph. They had the victims, they were gonna ship them, I believe, to the chief medical officer at Fort Worth. And when it's all strung together, Rudiak believes the document is nothing short of a bombshell. They found a disc, they found victims, they were shipping the victims out, and then they were gonna cover it up. So is it all really true? The debris, the victims, the cover-up. Is this the long-awaited proof that an alien spacecraft did crash outside Roswell? The US government has looked at the same evidence and come to a much different conclusion. of an alien spacecraft spawns TV shows, books, movies, even museums. And it turns the dead-end town of Roswell, New Mexico into a magnet for the truly bizarre. But as the 50th anniversary of the 1947 incident approaches, the debate over what really happened in Roswell intensifies. A growing grassroots movement presses the government for answers. What they get is evidence that the government has indeed been hiding a secret, one not even the Roswell advocate suspected. In 1993, Kent Jeffrey decides to join the Legion of Amateur Sleuths, hoping to find the truth about Roswell. Before I knew it, I was in it up to my neck. Jeffrey had spent a lot of time in the skies, a commercial airline pilot for 30 years, with a love of space and a fascination with UFOs. To him, Roswell is ground zero for proof that UFOs exist. I figured that if this incident had really happened, it was worth pursuing. It would have been the story of the millennium. Jeffrey has a special connection to Roswell. His father was an Air Force colonel who worked with the commander of Roswell's 509th bomb group. Jeffrey soon learns of witnesses who claim to have seen the strange wreckage and tell stories of alien bodies. I was told by one of the Roswell authors and researchers about a number of secret witnesses who were afraid to come forward because of government reprisal. And that's when I figured, well, something needs to be done about this. His first step? The Roswell Declaration, a worldwide petition signed by astronauts, scientists, and members of the military. 20,000 people in all, calling on the government to tell what it knows about Roswell. 
Jeffrey gets help from a New Mexico congressman who is also pressing for answers. The information I want is for the government to make public all of its records about the Roswell incident, or if those records have been destroyed, explain who destroyed them and under what authority and when. Under pressure, in 1994, the Air Force assigns Lieutenant Colonel Richard Weaver to head an inquiry. Weaver says he left no stone unturned and found a startling secret. We went back through all the records starting at that time, uh, looking for plausible explanations for what may have happened. We considered a nuclear accident, we considered a, uh, an errant missile crash, we considered airplane crashes, and we considered, quite frankly, the possibility of an extraterrestrial event that the government just had not owned up to. In his 1994 report, Fact versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert, Weaver did find something the government didn't want people to know about. Something he now believes is the truth about what happened that night in 1947. If there's a cover-up, the report says, it's not a cover-up of a flying saucer from outer space, but of a top-secret military project codenamed Mogul. Mogul is a huge apparatus of balloons and instruments spanning some 600 feet. It's designed to detect Soviet nuclear tests, one of the most pressing issues in those early days of the Cold War. The project is so secret, many of those who work on it don't even know its name. It was about as, as uh, highly classified as the Manhattan Project itself. In 1947, Charles Moore is Project Mogul's engineer. A retired university professor today, Moore believes those reports of flying saucers and the strange otherworldly wreckage on Brazel's ranch are really describing his balloon number four. It was launched in early June, some 50 miles downwind. We launched several of these long trains of, of uh, balloons. We were quite sure that uh, the reports that were appearing in the paper were of debris from some of our flights. We were pretty sure it was highly classified and uh, sooner forgotten the better and that local newspaper story, where the rancher describes strange foil, tape, and sticks. Moore says it sounds a lot like Mogul's radar targets. The uh, reflective material was aluminum foil laminated onto paper and deployed on balls of sticks uh, to make them lightweight so they could be carried aloft by balloons. Moore even explains those alien hieroglyphics intelligence officer Jesse Marcel and his son say they saw on the wreckage. The targets we used were, were reinforced with scotch tape on which was imprinted curious uh, uh, abstract figures, uh, squares and triangles and, and uh, Greek letters. But how could Jesse Marcel, an intelligence officer with special training in radar targets, possibly mistake what he saw for an alien spacecraft. I think he'd never seen such big balloons uh, as this before. Moore says the balloons setting out for days in the desert sun would have blackened and broken up, changing their appearance. After a week or so lying on the ground, the balloons would no longer appear to be balloons. And then there's this. Suppose for a moment the Roswell wreckage really was something extraterrestrial. Even the Air Force says that would be a big event. So big that it would have left some paper trail, some evidence. Instead, they say there is none. Could the government really succeed in keeping this top secret? Colonel Weaver doesn't think so. Somebody would have have to change literally thousands, if not millions, of records, such arcane things as flight schedules and manning documents and all sorts of, of routine things to, sh to eradicate the fact that something important happened. The Air Force also examines that photograph, the one with the memo in General Ramey's hand. Roswell researchers claim they can make out the word victims, but government analysts say they can't read a thing. Kent Jeffrey is starting to have serious doubts about the Roswell story. Driven to uncover the truth, 
he goes over the case again. At long last, Jeffrey thinks he's found what he's after, proof. Going into this, for me, it was a quest for the truth. By 1996, Kent Jeffrey has spent three years investigating the Roswell incident without finding definitive proof for or against it. Like so many researchers before him, he's stymied by contradictory evidence, some pointing to a government cover-up, some debunking it. Then, Jeffrey stumbles across declassified notes from a 1948 Air Force meeting just a year after Roswell. In it, a top intelligence officer calls the 1947 wave of UFO sightings a phenomenon that can't be laughed off. It seems a tantalizing clue, until Jeffrey reads what the officer says next. And I quote, I can't even tell you how much we would give to have one of those crash in an area so we could recover whatever they are. Far from confirming the existence of alien craft, the Colonel is merely hoping such things exist and wishes he could get his hands on one. For Jeffrey, it's a shocking revelation, but he still keeps looking. He tracks down other people who may have known about it, members of the 509th Bomb Group based in Roswell in 1947. I eventually spoke with 15 former B-29 pilots and two former B-29 navigators, all of whom felt the entire UFO matter was patently ridiculous. Next, Jeffrey finds top officers at the airbase that received the crash debris after it was shipped out of Roswell. They tell Jeffrey there was no crashed spaceship. It simply never happened. They give Jeffrey a signed affidavit. There was no alien spaceship and no secret hangar housing it. Of that, we give our word. Even testimony from the local undertaker. See here, you got the large eyes and the big heads. About an Air Force nurse who witnessed an alien autopsy falls apart. There are no records that such a nurse ever existed. After more than three years of dead ends, Jeffrey pays a visit to Professor Charles Moore, Project Mogul's engineer. There it is, in plain sight the radar reflector. The same thing Jeffrey believes is shown in those 1947 photographs. It was a no-brainer. That's exactly what it is. Other Roswell researchers claimed the debris in the pictures was substituted for the real wreckage. But the intelligence officer who accompanied Jesse Marcel Sr. in July 1947 says in an affidavit it was not substituted. The wreckage in the picture is exactly what he saw. Trying to sort out whether the wreckage was in fact switched, Jeffrey returns to the people who witnessed it. Jesse Marcel Sr. had passed away, but his son, who was only 11 at the time, remembers strange exotic debris. It was very light. I didn't try to bend it or tear it, uh, but I just kind of looked at it and just kind of wondered what this was. Jeffrey wonders if there's anything more. Hoping to find his answer, he turns to hypnosis. Just gonna do one other thing, I'll touch your wrist for a moment. And, uh, he wants to use the technique on Colonel Jesse Marcel Jr., me, who saw the debris his father brought home from the crash site. Maybe Marcel will be able to remember some more details of what his father showed him that night in July 1947. Marcel agrees. Let yourself be there now. Jesse Marcel Jr. is probably the most important living witness to the debris. I uh, held it up like that so I could see it better with the light. I remember uh, holding the light was up here. If the hypnosis could have brought out some previously suppressed information in his mind regarding exotic material, then there would have been uh, a reason to be optimistic that maybe there was something to all of this. The hypnosis is a bust. Marcel does not come up with any new information. 
wish I could just drag it out. Jesse simply remembered what he had already remembered consciously. A few pieces of uh, foil-like material, some plastic or Bakelite material, and a short beam with some unusual markings on it. That only reinforces Jeffrey's theory, that what Jesse Marcel Jr. saw on his kitchen floor in 1947 were the remains of a radar reflector from Project Mogul. That was the final nail in the coffin of the crash saucer scenario for me. Kent Jeffrey may be convinced that the Roswell incident was nothing more than a crashed Air Force experimental balloon. But other Roswell researchers aren't so sure. Project Mogul, they say, is the cover for the alien crash. The so-called secret project was not nearly as classified as the Air Force would have you believe. They actually had some launches where they just let him float down in the desert. Doesn't sound very classified to me. You don't let highly classified things just float down in the desert where your enemies, spies, can look at them. And the basic materials used in Mogul, like paper-backed foil, would never be confused for an alien spacecraft. You can go down to the grocery store and buy a Hershey bar, and, and what it's wrapped in is the exact same material that the radar targets are made from. So nobody would have been mystified by this. And then there are the famous photographs. Jesse Marcel Jr. insists the material in the picture is not what he saw. It was not the same. It's not at all. Roswell researchers say there's one explanation. The government switched the debris. And they believe there have been other suspicious doings as well. Jim Mars points to this 1995 GAO report. They came up with no documents stating that it was a saucer or they were aliens. But what they did find was that the, all of the communication records in and out of Roswell between 47 and 48 had all been somehow misplaced or destroyed. In 1997, the Air Force releases yet another report. This one called Roswell, case closed. Air Force officials hope this will explain once and for all any doubts about alien bodies. Bodies observed in the New Mexico desert were probably test dummies that were carried aloft by U.S. Air Force high altitude balloons for scientific research. But there's a problem with this explanation. Air Force records show that test dummies weren't used until 1953, six years after the crash at Roswell. Colonel, how do you square? Uh, the UFO enthusiast saying that uh, they're talking about 1947, but well, you're talking about dummies used in the uh, in the 50s, almost a decade later. Well, I'm afraid that's a problem that we have with time compression. I don't know what they saw in 47, but I think over a period of time they begin to lose exactly when the date was, and there were lots of dummies dropped. Well, obviously not all the dummies crashed at Roswell. <laughs> So is it really case closed when it comes to Roswell and UFOs? Thank you, sir. After delivering its 1997 press conference, the U.S. government officially closes the case on the Roswell incident. But the final word doesn't seem to satisfy people on either side of the debate. Hey, hey, UFOs, people have the right to know. Contradictory government documents, conflicting eyewitness reports, and intriguing clues that the government is still holding back key evidence all fuel the continued controversy. There will always be those who will not believe anything the government says, and I think that's terrible. But you have to ask yourself, whose fault is it? From a public relations standpoint, I think the government has handled it very poorly. But even poorly handled, Kent Jeffrey believes the government has given the best explanation so far about what fell to earth outside Roswell. I have absolutely no doubt that it was not an alien spaceship. I would stake my life on that, literally, without hesitation. And it was really a big disappointment for me. Adding to the skepticism of Jeffrey and many others 
is the fact that so many big leads over the years have not panned out. From discredited witnesses, to smoking gun documents that turned out to be fake, even the ever-growing number of alien landing sites in New Mexico. At last count, there are six in all, including this one that charges admission. Yet through it all, the true believers still believe. Oh, well, the Army came in and covered it up. They remain as convinced as ever that Roswell is the government's dirty big secret. Buried under decades of deceit, lies, and cover-ups. For Jim Mars, the proof is from all those people who've come forward to say they witnessed the incident firsthand. The thing that convinces me that something unearthly happened in Roswell is simply the sum total of the evidence. For Stan Friedman, the proof is right there, too, up there in the sky. What I marvel at is that there are stars so many billions of years older than the sun. What arrogance to think we're the big shots in the neighborhood. I think most people don't think we are. Today, many years have passed since the Roswell incident, and the search for proof has become a race against time. Frank Joyce, one of the few remaining witnesses, is 82. July 8th, 1947, I'd say that's pretty close to the beginning. Joyce still keeps the original wire copy from the incident in his Roswell file to help keep the memories fresh. Originally, my idea was to prove that it did come out officially on uh, the United Press wire. For a while, I actually thought that people might think I made the whole thing up. Not so. In December 2005, Walter Haught, the man who wrote the original press release that sparked that wire story, passed away. But he's left behind a legacy. In 1992, he started Roswell's International UFO Museum, along with the mortician who claims he ran into the nurse who saw an alien autopsy. Are you friendly? The museum has become a mecca for believers, skeptics, and, Everything was just a fraud. and everyone in between, drawing more than two and a half million visitors since its opening. It's 200 miles from anywhere, Albuquerque, Amarillo, El Paso. So if they're there, it's because they want to be there. So people are interested. The original Roswell investigators themselves are getting older, but they don't seem to be slowing down much. After all, there are still new tips to check out. I'm still working on the case. I've got a couple of hot leads, which I hope prove out. New clues to study. A possible UFO in There's North not a Georgia. day or a week goes by that somewhere somebody doesn't get some pretty good clear videotape of a UFO. And new documents to pry out of the government. I want to see the documentation. One of the interesting questions is why isn't there any documentation? These true believers say they'll fight on pursuing every last piece of evidence until they finally have proof, real proof, that explains what really crashed to Earth in July 1947, just outside of Roswell, New Mexico.